Well, hello, everybody. And um, what a joy it is to speak to you. I, I, I'm very grateful. I'm very thankful. And I'm thankful to the leadership for giving me this opportunity. Um, just uh, to start off with, I have been catching a healing this week. So um, I apologize in advance if I sound like I'm speaking out of a barrel. But um, just be thankful I wasn't leading worship. There's that. Okay. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> what I want to go after tonight is the culture of honor. That's what I felt in my heart. What it is, what it isn't, and how we can walk in it. So uh, what is culture? The Greek Hebrew word for that is tomeo, which means to assign a high value or regard with great respect. That's what it means. What, what honor isn't is something that can be demanded of people. And um, I can't demand that you honor me because honor has to come from my heart and honor has to come from your heart. It has to be something that we are. It's not exactly the same as respect because I can respect a traffic cop when he pulls me off at the side of the road because I have to, because if I don't, I'm in trouble. But honor is connected to love. And honor is connected to reverence. And honor is something that originates in the heart of God. And I think a classic example of how God honors in the face of dishonor has to be the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. Because if we, if we look into the Jewish culture, we begin to realize just exactly how dishonoring Everything that that boy did was to his Jewish father. For starters, when he said to him, I want my inheritance now, in effect, he was saying, I wish you were dead. That's really what he was saying. And according to culture, he should have been thrown out and possibly stoned for the disrespect and the dishonor to his father. But his father just does that and gives it to him. And when you realize, too, that he disappears and with half of the father's accumulated wealth over a lifetime and actually just wastes it, has absolutely nothing to show for it again. Then he ends up working with pigs, which in the Jewish culture was just disgusting, uh, consorting with Gentiles, which is probably even more disgusting, consorting with prostitutes, and then he comes home. And the father actually dishonors himself in order to honor the son, because a man of his standing should never, ever have run. It was considered undignified and dishonoring. And he runs to meet his son. And the reason he does that is to actually protect him because there would have been a gauntlet. The villagers knew what was going on. Everybody knew what had been happening. And they had the right to stand there and stone him as he came home. And the father runs and puts his arms around him because he's really saying, if you're going to stone my boy, you're going to stone me. And he runs and he does that. And then he says, bring the robe, which was actually his robe, which I think is absolutely beautiful, because we have the robe of righteousness, that is Jesus. And it's the festive robe of honor that the Father puts around him and restores honor to him in that moment. And the interesting thing is, they didn't have to fatten the calf. The calf was already fattened, which means that the Father intentionally was expecting him to come and had made up his mind, I will honor him when he arrives. And so honor becomes about who I am, not who the other person is. It's something I do. And there's a story of a mayor in a town. Um, he was entering the city hall, <coughs> uh, surrounded by his entourage. And the town drunk comes stumbling along and pushes the mayor out the way to get wherever he wants to go. And the mayor does nothing, and he says nothing. And so his people say to him, how can you do that? 
How can you just let that be, that amount of dishonor? And the mayor replies, oh, I can afford it. And the truth is we can afford honor because we are so honored. We have been honored by the Father. So what are the areas that, that we could look at in terms of honor? I think the first one I want to look at is honor for the presence. Because we need to not take the presence for granted. We can become blasé and casual about the fact that the presence is not only with us, but in us. And we need to sometimes remember that, as Steve was saying this morning, one man could go in once a year under pain of death if he didn't have it right. And we have that presence dwelling in here. He has come to dwell with us. But it can become so casual. We can get so used to it that we can become blasé about that. The, the definition of dishonor is to make common. And there is nothing common about the presence of God with his people. Nothing at all. So, and, and Steve had uh, that picture which just blew my brain forever of the moment of conception and then you, you have the cell, and then at that moment of conception, you see the flash of light. Well, bear with me, but I like to think that when we got born again, that same thing happened. Because our spirit was dead. Dead. And then we received Jesus, and the flash of light, <clears throat> and life comes. And I've heard people, you know, we... <laughs> I've heard people talk about worship music, people who are unregenerated, and they, they don't understand it. It's like, why is it so slow? Why do you keep saying the same thing over and over and over again? Because they're looking at the musicality of it. Why? Because their hearts can't respond. But when we come into a place of worship, our hearts can respond to the presence of God. And without the presence, we could not. We'd be standing there saying, this is so dull. Where's the beat? <laughs> and all the other stuff that goes on. So how, how has the presence honored us? And how can we honor the presence? There's a story. It, well, it actually starts in 1 Samuel 6 and 7. I'm not going to read it. It's really long. And then it goes on in 2 Samuel 6. But it's the story of the ark when it's captured by the Philistines and it's been in the Philistine camp. And then the Philistines start to get boils and all sorts of things going wrong. And so they call their priests, their occult priests and the diviners, and they say, is this a punishment from God? And the priests say to them, well, this is what you need to do. You need to put the ark on an ox cart and you need to let it go. And if it makes its own way back to the Israelites, then you know that this was God punishing you. So they duly do that, and the oxen go off, and they take the ark back to Israel. So Israel is very happy, and they house it in the, in the household of Abinadab. <clears throat> and it stays there for many, many years. And then later, David now wants to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And so they want to fetch it from the house of Abinadab and bring it. And so they come up with a bright idea. They say, oh, no, what we'll do? We'll put it on an ox cart and we'll take it to Jerusalem. And as it's trundling along, it begins to fall off. And the son of Abinadab, Uzzah, reaches out to stop it. And he's killed. It kills him. And so David just says, I don't want anything to do with this. And they take it to the house of Obed-Edom, and he leaves it there for a while. But it still matters how the ark is carried. Because what was the problem? Well, I think maybe Uzzah was over-familiar with the ark because it had been in his household for so long. And I think that God intended for the ark to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. 
because it's the mantle. And the shoulders speak of authority. And we are meant to carry the mantle of the anointing on our shoulders. And they came up with a man-made plan. They said, I know what we'll do. We'll put it on the ox cart. And so we can quench the presence by coming up with our own ideas and our own way of doing things. And we can get wrapped up in presentation at the expense of presence. And we need to be careful because it's good to do good things. We know that. There are lots of good things that we can be doing. But good does not always necessarily equal God in that situation. And we need to be open to hear what it is God is saying. And then we can grieve the presence. <clears throat> and how do we grieve the presence? Well, uh, Jesus at Calvary took back everything that had been lost in Eden. That's what it was all about. And so God had walked with his people in Eden. And then sin came and the separation came. And then Jesus comes and he restores. So in effect right now, this here, you, this is his paradise garden. And this is where he walks. And this is where he communicates with us. This is his place. And just like Adam and Eve were um, given the mandate, so are we to tend the garden. That's our job. The Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it spring forth the issues of life. So how do we tend the garden? By yielding. That's all that's required of us. When we become aware of something in our hearts that's, that's a weed, we need to yield that. We're not trying to make the garden beautiful. It is so beautiful. He has made it so beautiful. But it's our job to make sure it stays that way. And that's not through self-effort. That's by just yielding. So when he says, um, sweetie, that, that's not so nice, it's my job to say, okay, Lord, take it. I don't want it. And that's where grace comes in. And that's where the, the grace of the Holy Spirit comes and changes and rearranges. The next thing we need to honor is the word. John 1.1. 1, 1. <clears throat> in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So that word is as much his presence as an encounter is with him. And I'm not talking about the pages. People get a bit silly, like, oh, don't put your Bible on the floor. No, it's not it. It's ink <laughs> and paper. But the spirit of the word, the content of the word, the power of the word, it's the presence of Jesus. And we need to recognize that. And so how do I honor the word? By studying it. By meditating on it. By becoming intimate with it until it becomes me. By making it my life's sustenance, by shaping my life around it, and by making it the final authority in everything. And then by speaking in agreement with it. So in whatever circumstance I find myself, I need to be speaking what God speaks in that circumstance. I need to be in agreement with the heart of my father, not in agreement with the circumstance, not speaking the circumstance into being, but coming into agreement with what he has said and standing with him and speaking as one with the father. And that is how I honor the word of God. 
And then we need to honor one another as carriers of the divine presence. Jesus will not separate himself from his bride. We have quite a few young men here who got married this year. You will understand that. You and your bride are one. And if somebody says or does something, you take it very personally, right? Well, Jesus is no different. In Matthew 25, 40, he talks about if you gave a cup of water, you visited me in prison, you clothed me when I was naked. And the people say, but when did we see you naked? And when did we see you hungry? And when did we see you in prison? And he says, whatever you've done, to the least of these, my little ones. And he's not, he's not saying that some of us are least. <laughs> they are no, it's not like, oh, some are more important than others. There's a, the one translation says, no matter how unimportant they may seem, you've done it to me. And when he confronts uh, Saul on the road to Damascus, he doesn't say, why have you been persecuting my church? He says, why are you persecuting me? So we need to carry a consciousness of that presence. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, so from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. God grant us eyes to see spirit more than we see flesh. And I beg of you, I beseech you, brethren, <laughs> that sounds, very, sounds so biblical, don't shame his bride. Oh, don't shame his bride. He paid the ultimate price just because he wanted to hold her close to his heart again. Don't say and do things that will cause her to run and hide, and find fig leaves again. I want to just tell you a story, and it's very personal, and that's okay. Um, when I met my wonderful Michael, young Mike, who's also catching a healing, by the way, <laughs> um, and I knew this is my man, okay? I was not a spring chicken, all right? In fact, I was at that point 36 or 37. I'd never been married. But I decided I'm going the full nine yards here. And if you know my testimony, I had struggled up against a spirit of shame my whole life. But I decided I'm doing it. The white satin, the lace, the pearls, the veil, the whole thing. I just, I was putting myself out there by faith. I just said, God, I'm doing this. And so on my wedding day, <clears throat> I'm busy. I was getting dressed in all of this confectionery. And um, the bridesmaids were busy leaving. They were getting in the cars to go. Oh, and I took one last look at myself in the mirror. And I just thought, this looks so stupid. What did I think I was doing? I can't do this. I really can't. But it was too late. I couldn't rush out and buy another outfit. I was, there was nothing I could do. But I just suddenly felt like I can't, I can't be this. I can't. I think it was the enemy's last shot, you know? So I thought, well, okay, so I'm just going to spend my wedding day feeling awkward. There's nothing else I can do. And I walked out of the room. And there in the room were, were the men who were there to drive the bridesmaids and the groomsmen and very chilled guys, you know. They weren't young either because Michael was 42 by then, I think. So, and they were fairly chilled. They weren't given to youthful exuberance any longer. And so I, um, I walked out expecting in my heart for there to be just a stony silence or 
Maybe they would do the polite thing, but I'd know. Mm, you don't really feel this. And as I stepped into the room, the room erupted. They went ballistic. They were losing their minds. <laughs> I, I remember one particular man who is as emotional as a plank. He was, he, they were bouncing around like schoolboys, red in the face, perspiring with excitement. Like, wow, look at you. And as I stood there, and I was like stunned by all of this, I thought, I can do this. And that moved into, I can be this. And by the end of that day, it was, I am this. Can we be that for one another? Can we do that for one another? Because we all have moments where we just feel, you know, I don't fit into all of this. Can we get red in the face and perspire with excitement at the beauty of who we are and how magnificent we are? Thank you. Guys, he's done it. He's done it. And we have no idea of the splendor of what we are on the inside. Can we be that for one another? Can we do that? So what does that mean? We can never correct anybody. Does that mean when, when, there's, when there's an issue, we must just love each other through gritted teeth? I love you with the love of the Lord. And just pretend nothing's happening. I don't think so. We can't. Obviously we can't. But there's a scripture that says, Colossians 4 verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So we can be salty <laughs> when we need to, but let it be gracious. And in all of our whatever we're doing, let us be constantly aware this is the bride of Christ. This is his beloved bride. So, because, and again, it's, it's not what you're saying. It's what is coming out of, because truth is good. We love truth. Truth sets us free. But truth from a heart that is bitter and angry is terribly destructive. So we need to know that our heart is in the right place before we speak. And if it's not, then we need to go and get it in the right place and then come back and speak so that we are never destroying one another but only ever building and creating good. Another thing is don't ever judge people in their valley experience because we all go through valleys. Paul said, I've learned to be abased and I've learned to abound. Paul goes from living in Caesar's palace and he ends up in the, in the dungeon. He's in both, but he's just the same wherever he is. He's still Paul the Apostle. And we will all go through valleys and then we will be abounding and then we will be abased again. So don't judge people in that. We all have to go through death experiences, but there's the life coming. There always is life coming. So what does the culture of honor achieve? Oh, I think so much. It achieves freedom, for one. If I'm in a culture like I am tonight, I know I'm accepted. I know that I'm honored here. I'm free. I'm, I'm not feeling defensive. I'm not feeling like I have to be careful what I say. So when we're in that culture, we're free to be who we are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and know that we're loved, which allows God to deal. We don't have to hide things away. It develops a culture of trust, of growth, and power. 
because you can't really walk in something that you don't honor. And I honestly believe the more we learn to honor the presence, to honor the anointing, the more we'll walk in it, the more power we will walk in. So I, the first time I ever spoke here, I gave a bit of a testimony of, of Michael and myself when we first arrived here and we'd crawled up the hill <laughs> like refugees. <laughs> <laughs> and we were in the valley of the shadow of death big time. And um, how that God, when we got here, surrounded us with people who honored us. For no good reason. We weren't doing anything. We weren't bringing anything to the table. It was just a big pile of problems that had arrived. And God just put people around us who who could see the promised land in us. And we couldn't see it anymore. We were just shell-shocked. <laughs> we were what? But people around us honored us and saw it in us. And that's what got us back on our feet. And that's what got us back moving in kingdom and moving in our destiny, which to all intents and purposes in our hearts was gone and lost forever. But honor brought us back. And if we come into an atmosphere of judgment and criticism, we would have just continued the withering until we were dead. That was it. So, yeah, I want to just leave it with that and say, guys, we are so honored that we can afford to honor. We really can. So if we could have the keyboards, thank you. I'm just going to pray. <clears throat> Father, I just <laughs> thank you for the amazing honor of your presence. That you should choose to dwell among us, Lord. That Jesus, you should choose to pay the price that you did. So that you could. We just honor you here tonight, Jesus. We honor your presence. We honor your word and we honor one another. Thank you for holiness. Thank you for righteousness. Thank you for the beauty that we are. It goes beyond what we can understand, Lord. We need to just accept by faith. And so we worship you here tonight, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. For your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you, Jesus.